I get near Shabbos, everybody. Welcome to Jerry's Parsha Ponderings for Parshi Arbo and Bishalach. Apologize for not doing Bo last week, but I was uh, out and about on the road. So uh, seeing that Bo and Bishalach are kind of um, partners in the Gula story, kind of go together. Um, the whole Makat Bachorod into Kriyat Yam. So let's uh, put them all together and. Uh, spend a few minutes uh, discussing these two very important parshiot. So let's go. Uh, we'll start with Parshat Bo, of course. And uh, to me, the most uh, intriguing part of Parshat Bo is, of course, Makat Choshech. We have the last three Makot, the Arba, of course. I saw those in Vegas a few months ago, the migrating of the desert locust. It really was like Makat Arba. And being a Bechor, I said, uh, well, let's see, I got Arba Choshech, Makat Bechor. So Ruchi and I, we just uh, head out, uh, headed out into the desert and went west. Um, so, uh, but Makat Choshech is uh, really kind of where the rubber meets the road in the whole uh, Gulat Mitzrayim story. This is the part where uh, four fifths of Am Yisrael perished. Uh, during Makat Choshech, and we know that the Maka of Choshech wasn't just your average everyday blackout, it was you didn't move, it was thick. Um, and only Bnei Yisrael were able to move around during Makat Choshech, and we know that Rashi tells us that they uh, went into their neighbors' houses, uh, neighbors in this case being the Egyptians, and they uh, discovered where their treasures were. And when they left after Makat uh, Bechorot, they said, uh, you know, give me a payment for the years of work that we did. And they said, well, we don't have any treasure. And they said, yes, it is. It's in your top drawer and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, they didn't take anything. It was given to them as payment for the years that uh, Bnei Yisrael worked in Mitzrayim. But the most uh, intriguing part of this, again, is that 80% of Am Yisrael died during Makar Choshech, and they had to be buried by the other 20%. Why did they die? Is it because they didn't believe in the redemption? No, they believed in the redemption. They died because they didn't want to go. Why didn't they want to go? Well, let's think about it. The Shi'ibud, the slavery ended after Makadam. Between Makadam and Makad Bechorot, it was about a year's time. Already after the first Makkah, the, the Mitzrayim stopped enslaving the Bnei Yisrael. They were afraid. They, they knew something big was coming. Paro, on the other hand, as we know, lost his Bechira after the fifth Makkah. God gave him five chances to do the right thing, and then it was kind of like, I'll take over here. And he lost his Bechira. But the Bnei Yisrael during Makar Choshech had already, they, they had become already store owners and business owners and uh, the, the Egyptians were afraid of them. And they were saying, wait, uh, no, we'll be able to build a great community here. We'll be able to build uh, Bate Medrash and uh, have thriving businesses here in the Fertile Crescent, uh, right, uh, right by the Nile. Let's, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll build Bate Medrash on both sides of the Nile, build a thriving Torah community. And God said, no, uh, no, 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 no. The Torah is not for in Egypt. The Torah is not for in Chutz Laretz. We're going to the land flowing with milk and honey. And they're like, uh, wait, 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 wait. I got a good business here already. I, we worked for 210 years, and now we're finally uh, doing well. Why should we have to leave? Uh, because this isn't the place. And they didn't want to go. So they stayed in the ground, which is the story of Am Yisrael, when they don't want to leave, they stay in the ground one way or the other. But those that 
believed and really wanted to to leave Egypt and to go to Eretz Yisrael, they were the ones ultimately who wound up going. And, and how did they prove their fealty to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? And that, of course, was in the Makkah of uh, Bacharod, in the, in the final Makkah. What had to happen there? So Am Yisrael had to go take the Egyptian sheep god and slaughter it and cook it. Where? In the middle of the street. In other words, they took the holy item of their oppressors and went out into the middle of the street, slaughtered it. I mean, you can imagine the scene here. I mean, sheep all over being slaughtered. The, the silence of the lambs or lack thereof and then they had to take the blood, and, and now they're barbecuing. This is a big barbecue, right? They had to roast it whole so that the Egyptians would see that this is indeed their god that is being slaughtered in the middle of the street. Interesting, Rochi and I were just in the, in the British Museum. In the British Museum, you can actually see an idol of the sheep god called the Piachirot. For, that was taken from ancient Egypt when the British Empire took over, and it's on display in the British Museum. You can actually see an idol of the sheep god, small g. So what did the Bnei Israel do? They had to slaughter it, cook it, so that it could be fully recognized as what it was. They didn't make a pot, right? The carbon Pesach, it has to be Rosho Al Kirbo. You had to take it with the intestines and barbecue that puppy right out in the middle of the street, right? Take a, take a spit and perform an insertionary procedure and rotisserie right there in, in full view so they can not only see and hear, but smell their God being burnt. And then the Jews took the blood and painted their doorpost with it to say, hey, by the way, if you want to know who did this, here we are. You want to do something about it? Bring it. And no one did a darn thing, not even the dogs didn't bark at the Jews. Right, And that's how they showed Hashem, we believe we want to go. We're making this mark on our door, which is why to this day we have the mezuzot on our door, Leil Shimurim. It was a night where God protected us from our oppressors that were horrified at the view of their God, again, small g, being barbecued in the middle of the street. And there was nothing they could do. And because we showed Hashem this house with the, with the blood on it, we want to go to Eretz Yisrael, that's how we were saved. And what happens shortly thereafter? The famous scene, Cecil B. DeMille, Lahavdil. Okay? Kriyas Yamsef. What happens? After Makas Bechoros, God takes Am Yisrael, those that were, that were willing to go, that wanted to go out. Of course, three days later, uh, Paro once again loses his Bechira, chases after Am Yisrael, and there they are on the, and there they are, right? They got the Egyptians behind them, they got the water in front of them. What do we do? They cry out to Hashem, Hashem's like, uh, you just saw 10 Makos. Uh, you were barbecuing the God and no one did anything. You don't think I could handle this? No problem. Moshe, the famous scene with the stick, right? The water split. We all know what happens. But once again, they had to prove that they were willing to go they're there, the water's in front of them. The Egyptians are behind them. They're crying to Hashem, Hashem, how can, why did you take us out of Mitzrayim to die here? And Hashem's like to Moshe, Matitzakeli, Dabar el Bnei Yisrael v'Yiso. <laughs> what are you crying? This isn't the time to say Tehillim. 
right this isn't now is a time for action go don't wait sitting here waiting for mashiach now is the time to go daber el b'nei yisrael v'yiso you want eretz yisrael go don't pray and don't we want Mashiach now. It's good. It's very important to daven. Of course you should daven and we should sing we want Mashiach now. But words without action are meaningless. Daber el b'nei Yisrael and go. Nachshon jumped in and it all happened. All it took was one nefesh benefesh flight to start the literal floodgates from opening. And they did. And they did. Once we showed Hashem that we wanted to go. Again, think, Choshech, those that didn't want to go. Makas Bechoros, we had to prove to Hashem that, that you remember the houses that had the blood on them, that's the one where the Egyptians said, get out. Whether you like it or not, at this point, you're going. And then at, uh, at Kriyas Yamsuf, again, we had to show that we wanted to go. And that brought on a great song. The Shirat Hayam right afterwards. Then finally, B'nai Yisrael, they saw, you know, you always have that fear, you know, a person that's a survivor, a person that's been through trauma is always afraid that their, that their oppressor will come once again. Ask anyone that's a survivor of molestation or violence, but when you see that, when you see the ultimate justice, when you see the oppressor lying dead there, that, Rabbi Sai, is a reason to sing. And uh, liberals always love to say, oh, yes, but, you know, Hashem said that Masa Yadai Tovim Bayam, and you're going to sing. No, no, that, he didn't say that to B'nai Yisrael. He said that to the Malchai Asharis. Lo nitna hatora la Malchai Asharis. We are allowed to shira la Hashem bechayai yitamu chatayim in aretz. We are allowed to sing. Not only are we allowed to sing, we're supposed to sing. When we see justice, when we see evil eradicated, when we see Soleimani blown up, when we see our oppressors lying dead, yes, we are not angels. As Greg Ullman said, I'm no angel. No, I'm not going to sing this. I want to, but I won't. The, but Shira, we do sing when we see justice, when we see Hashem's justice in this world. And not only the men, but the women, Miriam, Miriam, who finally saw the, the fulfillment, who finally saw the fulfillment of her dream, of her brother leading the Jews out of Mitzrayim, as Eliza Lipkin said in her beautiful Dvar Torah this week, with her permission, that Miriam sang because she knew all these years that Moshe was going to be the one to lead the Bnei Israel out of Egypt. And she took the women and they sang. And by the way, I don't think there was a machitza there. They actually danced and sang. Shh, don't tell anybody. They weren't that from back then. But we sang and we sang to Hashem and we thanked him for letting us see the ultimate justice. Right after that, once again, B'nai Yisrael are complaining. Surprise, surprise. What are we going to eat? God says again, I can do that. I got this. All you have to do is believe. You believe and know that Hashem can do it and not and if you believe that Hashem can provide it'll rain from the heavens not only rain but actual food what is the whole idea of the Parshat Haman why do people say Parshat Haman every day why do people say it on Tuesdays why do people say it whenever they say it because it's showing Hashem we whatever we have we are grateful for, and we know, we know that you will provide it. That's the whole idea of the story of the man. Hashem said, even in the desert where there's nothing, I can provide for you. All you have to do is believe that I can do it. 
It's like Olam Haba. If you believe in it, you'll get it. If you don't believe in it, you won't. Tchiyad HaMetim. You believe in it? Absolutely. You don't believe in it? Eretz Yisrael. You believe in it? You got to go get it. If you don't, if you just say words, God's not impressed. No one's impressed. Actions. Actions speak louder than words. And then we know the story shortly thereafter with the water. Right? And the Bnei Yisrael said, Hayesh Hashem Bekir Beinu am I? And is God really with us? Again, you're asking. You just saw the, again, these are the same people realized that they had PTSD like big, right? Huge PTSD, 210 years in slavery, generations of slaves finally becoming free, and they still are traumatized. Is God really with us? Ay, if you ask, Hashem will show you the hard way. Yeah, Hashem's with you. And then the whole story with Moshe raising his hands and Yoshua fighting Amalek. Amalek came. Why did Amalek come? Hayesh Hashem bekir beinu You don't. You don't believe. You don't believe. Um, now we're gonna. You, sometimes you have to learn the hard way. Hashem will send an Amalek once in a while to give us a patch if we're not behaving properly. If we don't behave properly, Amaleks come. There are all sorts of Amaleks. Halachi hi biyaduash, Esav Sineas Yaakov. Amalek is the grandson of Esav. Right? If we don't believe and if we don't do what we're supposed to, we're going to be reminded. We will be victorious. Hashem promised Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov that we'll be victorious, but we will pay a heavy price as we have throughout history. And again, Masa Avosem on Lebanon. Let's not wait for an Amalek. Let's not bring an Amalek. Let's avoid it altogether. Lo al yidei nisayon, velo al yidei vizayon. We should not be embarrassed. We should not be ashamed. We should not be tested. But if it happens, we'll understand why. The ultimate redemption, of course, as the whole purpose of this, uh, the, the whole purpose of this exercise is to drive home the point. We are all an achshon. We all have to jump in. We all have to make the sacrifice, physically and spiritually, to bring the redemption, to bring Mashiach. And the only way that's going to happen, Rabbo say, is by actions, not by words. Words are good. Prayer is important. But ultimately, it's the actions that matter. Shabbos Makara Bracha Shabbos is the ultimate source of all blessing. As Walter says, Bishomer Shabbos. Do the right thing. Keep Hashem's holy day. Spend a day with your family. Turn off the damn phones. And... Spend the day with the Creator, just you and your family and Hashem, and turn off, as Rav Pes the great Rav Pesach Kron says, you have, to re you have to disconnect to reconnect. Shabbosi Makar HaBracha. Thank you very much for joining us for Jerry's Parsha Ponderings, for Parshas Bishalach and Parshas Bo. Please join us back here next week when we will discuss... Parshas Yisro, top 10. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Have an absolutely wonderful Shabbos.